to another uh, episode of Smart Boating. Today we're uh, with Ralph Davies at the Gloucester Marina here in Gloucester, Massachusetts to learn a little bit about uh, winterizing a motor. And in particular, we're going to look at a stern drive this morning. Now, Ralph, uh, in general, there's, there's three issues in terms of winterizing a motor. One of them is uh, preventing the motor from getting gummed up over the long winter season. The second one is uh, corrosion. Uh, internal parts, external parts, and certainly the harmful effects of water. Water could make things freeze in the motor or in the drive. And the last thing is uh, making sure everything's properly lubricated. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. All right. Well, um, there's a couple different aspects. Uh, there's some the motor aspects located within the boat, and then with the outdrive outside the boat. Would, would you like to start with the outdrive this morning? Sure, that'd be fine. Uh, let's uh, see what we can do rel relative to winterizing the outdrive on an inboard outboard, an I.O. Okay, all right. It looks like you're draining the oil here, Ralph. What's, what's going on there? Yeah, well, I just pulled the uh, lower drain plug. Uh, actually, there's two plugs, one in the upper housing and one in the lower housing. And I pulled the lower housing plug out after the top housing. And the idea of that is it will allow the air to come into the top housing and allow the oil to come out through the bottom. This yeah. is gear oil. Yeah. Now, one of the reasons for doing winterization, especially in New England or in the northern part, is we want to make sure that if there's any water in the outdrive, the lower unit, we want to make sure that that's drained out in the fall because if the water's left in there during the winter time, the water would freeze, and if the water freezes, it expands, and there's a possibility of rupturing, breaking the aluminum housing, and creating a you know a major problem, major expense in the lower unit. In addition to what I just said, another reason for uh, draining the oil out is to see whether or not there's any uh, metal particles in there. If there's any substantial amount of metal particles in there, it means that something's wearing inside, uh, either the gears or bearings or, or, or something. You find uh, when you pull the plugs that the oil is sort of a milky color. Uh, you know that water is getting into the unit somehow. Uh, either the seals are leaking or O-rings or, or whatever. In addition to that, if it's really white, then you know you have substantial problems. In addition to that, what happens is the lubricity uh, decreases obviously when you get water mixed with the oil and eventually if all the oil disappears inside then you have no lubrication other than water and water is not a very good lubricant. Right. It doesn't matter whether it's fresh water like in a lake or a river or whether it's in the salt water you still have a, a major problem. Okay, all right. Now uh, in addition to draining the oil um, we can fill the, refill the oil and the way that we go about doing that is we have a plug assembly that fits in the base here and we have a pressurized container now most people do not have a pressurized container if they decide that they're going to try and do this themselves and I would caution anybody that you got to be real careful from a safety point of view and also from a point of view of knowing what you're doing. Uh -huh. um, that's why it's always advisable to try and have somebody who's a professional do this type of an operation. I see. That's not saying that the homeowner cannot do it, but the problem is if something's not done correctly and something breaks or it's a warranty situation, then that's a major problem because it hasn't been, uh, the work has not been accomplished by our certified technician. Right. So, you know, we need to keep that in mind. Okay. So all we need to do then is hook up here, like this here, to the bottom unit. And then we would need to put the lower unit to the down position. Okay. Before we open up the valve in order to fill the oil from the bottom up to the top. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. This being a pressurized container, you can pump it up like so and the air pressure will allow the oil to come up through and eventually it'll come dribbling out the top. Okay. Then after that's completed, it's just a matter of removing this here and putting the plug in the top first. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is that would hold the oil in while you remove the bottom plug or the bottom 
fitting and put a new plug in. case is the, there is a trim tab zinc which fits in here and in many cases the bolt is difficult to remove because the salt water mm -hmm. has an effect of corroding it in there. Yes. So that's a problem but it can be overcome mm -hmm. by various means. And then also there are some little they look like half balls, if you will. Okay. And uh, again, they're located down below. The reason for having these zincs, they're called zinc anodes, mm -hmm. is such that these will disintegrate first before affecting the rest of the unit, that is, the outdrive and the housing and so forth. So these are called sacrificial anodes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And what happens here is over a period of time in the water, they deteriorate. And the reason for that is because of the uh, electrolysis usually that's in the water or the similar metals. Also, another thing that needs to be accomplished is uh, greasing the fittings. Now, there's a fitting here, here, and on the other side, and another one down below. Mm -hmm. Depending on what type of a uh, inboard outboard or an outdrive you have, mm -hmm. you may have anywhere from four to five or six fittings. Mm -hmm. And you need the correct grease for the correct type of application. Mm -hmm. the, this would be a grease fitting for these, uh, this would be grease for these grease fittings. Mm -hmm. And then if you were working with a universal joint uh, on the inside of this unit, you would use universal joint grease, okay. which is a different type of grease. Uh -huh. Let me just talk a little bit about, uh, after greasing these here, uh, the other thing to contend with or consider would be you need to take and remove this outdrive here uh -huh. at least once every other year. Okay. And the reason for that is inside in back inside here that you can't see where the, the transom of the boat is, there's a big bearing. It's called a gimbal bearing. And there's a grease fitting on the side where you can grease that. Uh -huh. But the problem is over a period of time, you never know whether or not that bearing is becoming worn unless it, something really lets go and uh, then there would be a loud noise or if you turn the steering wheel of the boat to one side or the other side, you might get a, a substantial noise which could be worn universal joints or possibly a worn gimbal bearing or, or both or some other problem. Uh -huh. In addition to that, every year you need to inspect the rubber bellows assembly okay. that covers the uh, universal joints. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now obviously you can do that visually every year, but then when you pull the outdrive off, you can visually inspect it on the outside as also inspect on the inside of the bellows. Okay. If there's any water on the inside of the bellows, you know that you've got leakage, you've got a problem with the rubber bellows assembly. All right. Also, if there's a lot of oil or grease, excessive amounts of oil or grease, then you know you've got a problem. The problem, if there's a lot of oil, typically would be in the top of this outdrive, mm -hmm. there is an oil seal there. Mm -hmm. And if that oil seal becomes worn, mm -hmm. it allows the oil from this outdrive to go through into that rubber bellows. Okay. So that would be a telltale sign right there that you have a problem. Right. And in order to fix that, you'd have to have the unit off and then replace the bearing, uh, the, uh, the, the assembly and the oil seals inside there actually comes apart as a whole unit. Okay. The last thing that I want to talk about here would be on the prop. Okay. It's always advisable to pull the prop off at the end of the season, whether it's fresh water or whether it's salt water. Okay. And what it usually entails is there's a locking device here, so you can loosen the locking device. Yeah. And then you can take with a wrench you can remove the nut. Mm -hmm. And in most cases, it's probably advisable to take and put a block of wood in between here so that when you turn this, you're not holding this propeller. Right, right. Because from a safety point of view, you never want to get your hands in between here because right. anything possibly could happen. Yeah. 
When you take and pull the propeller off, in many cases you will find there's a lot of uh, fishing material. Uh, from uh, It could be rope or it could be uh, not necessarily wire, but it could be some kind of fishing line. And in many cases, the fishing line wraps around, 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 and builds up. And what happens is, as the propeller's turning, the fishing line takes and cuts into the seals, the oil seals okay. that are inside here. Yeah. And then the next thing you know is you start having oil leakage out by the propeller shaft. I see. Mm -hmm. So the only way you could find that out would be to pull the propeller off and mm -hmm. you know just mm -hmm. physically look. The other thing you can take when you go to put the propeller back on, you can take and grease the propeller shaft so that each year when you go to take it off, the propeller comes off. If you don't put any grease on there, the salt packs in, and then you may have to use a special uh, puller for propellers in order to even pull the propeller off of the shaft. Right, right, right. And the average homeowner doesn't have that capability. Right, right. So those are some of the, the key points right here, and I guess what we need to do now is lower the unit down and fill the lower unit up with oil. Okay, that sounds great, Ralph. Let's move right into that. Okay, we'll do that. Opportunity to take and fill the lower unit from the pressure pot, and if you notice, there's some oil running out through this vent fitting right here, or the mm -hmm. top fitting. Mm -hmm. Um, I've let it uh, stabilize to make sure that there's no air bubbles and to make sure that the oil level is correct in here. Okay. And now all we need to do now is put in the top plug. If you remember a little bit earlier I said make sure you put in the top plug first which would retain the oil and then you can take and remove this fitting down below and then with the magnetic plug it's just a matter of undoing this fitting here and installing the magnetic plug. That way there you just need to make sure that you have the top plug and the bottom plug in the okay, we're at a point now where we want to hook up the flushette with a water hose uh, to the lower unit so that we can start and run the engine. It's very important to make sure that you have the flushette securely fastened. Uh, there's different types of uh, flushettes, but you want to make sure it's securely fastened to the inlet where the water would normally go in through the lower unit to the engine being sucked up by the water pump and it's important to make sure that you do not start the engine without having water hooked up. If you start the engine with no water hooked up and running, water running, within probably 10 to 15 seconds the rubber impeller inside the water pump probably would turn to a mushy like substance. Okay. Uh, which is a real problem. Then obviously it doesn't pump water and then the engine overheats and you have to pull the outdrive off and you have to replace the water pump and over many years with my experience I've seen a lot of different units come in and they, the reason they came in was they launched the boat and the engine overheated. Well the reason the engine overheated is in their backyard they took and they started the engine without having any water hooked up. Mm -hmm. And obviously you know what happened to the rubber impeller inside. The water of systems that you have. One system is called a closed system. In the closed system, what that means is there is no water, salt water or fresh water, that flows through the block itself, but rather there's a thermostat there, there's some type of a heat exchanger, and the, there's antifreeze in the system. And it's closed, meaning that no antifreeze escapes, unless there's some problem. Right. And that antifreeze, like in your car, continually keeps circulating and circulating. The only water that comes in, either salt water or fresh water, would be used to cool down the exhaust system. Mm -hmm. And obviously, 
either the exhaust manifold or in many cases the risers, they have what they're called heat risers, they have a tendency to contaminate because there is salt water coming in or fresh water coming in and that's what rust and the passageways get clogged with rust. So knowing that there's two systems, if you're running just fresh water or salt water through the system, you do not have to check the antifreeze. But if you are running a closed system, you need to use an antifreeze tester like you would for your car. Mm -hmm. And the idea of that is you take a sample out of the closed system. There's a cap that you undo just like a radiator on your car. And uh, you use a device which you can purchase in any automotive store or any marine store which will take a sample of the antifreeze and will tell you what it's good for as far as temperature. Whether it's good for 10 degrees below zero, 20 degrees below, 30 below, or whatever. And obviously, if you take a sample and it's only good for, say, 30 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, and you live in the northern part of the United States, you may have a problem with something freezing. And if it freezes, as I mentioned, water expands and uh, obviously something may crack. So we flush the system and after we flush the system then I'll comment about how we can utilize non-toxic antifreeze in order to work with an open system. Right. So right now we're going to take and I've got the flush head hooked up and I'm going to hook up the water and then we'll start the engine. Okay? Sounds great Ralph. Okay Paul. been running the engine now for about 15 minutes of fresh water that's allowed uh, fresh water to go through all the systems get rid of hopefully as much salt as possible and any other contaminants now with this particular boat this engine has what is called a closed system this is like what you have in your car where you have a radiator and you've got antifreeze so in a little bit when I get inside the boat I'll show you how to test the antifreeze Meanwhile, if you have an open system, meaning raw water cool through the entire system, mm -hmm. then you would not have to check antifreeze, and I would show you in just a minute here the procedure that you would go through. Mm -hmm. All right, we've run the engine for about 15 minutes. The first thing I would do is get up inside the boat, and I would pull out the plugs in the block, the drain plugs in the block. Now sometimes water doesn't come out, so you've got to take a little small screwdriver or whatever to loosen up any, uh, might be rust particles or nobody knows exactly what, but typically rust. That way the, the water would drain out. You also need to look and see if there are any other places that you need to drain water, such as in a heat exchanger or possibly a transmission cooler if it happens to have a drain. So every boat's a little bit different, yeah. but uh, if you don't know exactly what you're doing, then the best advice I could give you would be to bring your vessel to a place that has a professional where they will do the work and it's warranted as such, and you know, they pretty much know what they're doing. Right, right. Good now, uh, the other thing that I want to show is <clears throat> two possible ways that you can take and put antifreeze into an open system or a closed system. Okay. <clears throat> the only difference with the closed system is you don't have to pull any drain plugs because you don't want antifreeze coming out of the engine. Mm -hmm. But you do have to have antifreeze go through where the heat riser is and possibly any other units in there, a manifold or something. So you want to protect that so there's no water left that would freeze. Mm -hmm. uh, we use non-toxic antifreeze. It's not a permanent antifreeze like you might put in your, your automotive application. Some of them are good for a year or two. Some have extended life of five years. And a lot of your newer boats with a closed system, newer marine engines, mm -hmm. use that five-year type of antifreeze. Non-toxic is such like this. Actually, uh, at a couple of the shows that I've been to, I've seen the individual selling the stuff taken and mix it with a little water and drink a little bit of it 
and uh, they're still alive, okay. so it, it's non-toxic. Uh -huh. But this is good for, in its pure state like this, for about 50 below zero. For, you can buy it 30, 40, 50 below zero. I see. And uh, it just depends on what part of the country you're in and you know what you want to use. There's right. different prices for all of these. Mm -hmm. Now, if you have two people, you can have one person up inside the boat ready to start the engine and that same person would take and dribble in some fogging oil in through the carburetor which would lubricate through the valve system and so forth and it would be smoky there'd be a lot of smoke coming out through the exhaust here mm -hmm. if it was an electronic fuel injection system then probably you would need to run a special mix through the system of gasoline, fuel preservative, and some type of a, an oiling substance. Yeah. There's different products on the market. Mm -hmm. With a carburetor, you can actually dribble oil in, but with an electronic fuel injection system, it's a little bit different. Good point. So, what one would do then is, one would start pouring here, which would allow the fluid, the non-toxic, to go where the pickup is, mm -hmm. down in the lower unit, mm -hmm. and as soon as this was full, like so, the other person would start the engine. Mm -hmm. Once the engine's running, then the person out here would have to keep pouring. Mm -hmm. And for a four-cylinder engine, it probably would take three to four gallons of uh, non-toxic antifreeze. For a V6, it probably would take uh, at least, or very close to four, so you better figure on four. And with a V8, it would take four to five, I see. just depending on what you have in the system and, and the block and so forth. Mm -hmm. If it's a big V8 engine, such as uh, some of the larger boats use a, a big 454 block engine, or even larger than that, it might take uh, six gallons, or it varies, so okay. right. you know, you, you, that's why it's always better, if you know, don't know what you're doing, to take and go to somebody who does. So the, question, the other procedure would be to fill a bucket like this, full of the non-toxic, hook up your hose, so in reality, instead of having the hose go, like I showed you, to a funnel. It would go to a fitting here. Mm -hmm. Then you could open this fitting, start your engine, put in your dribble of, of fogging oil. Mm -hmm. However, key ingredient, you got to make sure that this does not run dry, because if it does, then you're going to burn up the impeller in your lower unit, which this is one. the water yeah. pump. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And depending on how large a bucket is, this will probably hold about maybe three gallons, uh, maybe a little more. But anyway, if you have a big V8 engine, you're going to need four, maybe five gallons. And you got to replenish the, the antifreeze in here as well as fogging. So mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. advisable, if at all possible, to have two people. And if you don't have two people, then bring the entire unit to some place to have it uh, winterized. Right. The point. main reason for winterizing is it a, it's money well spent because if there's any problems or whatever you can pick it up you can get parts ordered it could be fixed in the fall or it could be fixed in the spring and in addition to that it preserves all inside the engine the engine's filled with non-toxic the inside of the engine has got oil in it the uh, fuel system has a uh, fuel storage store and start or some type of a substance that's been added to it for prolonged storage and I'll show that when I get inside the boat. Well, uh, back inside the boat now uh, this particular engine has an air filter and uh, which is typical of all the marine engines they have uh, it's called uh, well like a car it's like an air filter but in, re in reality it's to prevent any kind of uh, backflash from the carburetor mm -hmm. and it's a safety feature obviously mm -hmm. and what I'm going to do once the engine's running I'm going to take and slowly dribble in a little bit of this oil mm -hmm. now if you put too much oil in there you're going to stall or kill the engine remember also at the same time that I'm putting in this oil what's happening is the non-toxic antifreeze is going through the engine 
and then after the engine has the non-toxic through it and it's been fogged we shut the engine down since the engine is nice and warm then we'll go about uh, draining the oil and I'll show you how to do that in a couple minutes so we're all ready to run now okay here we go Okay, Paul, uh, we've run the engine previously, as I mentioned, uh, about 15 minutes or so with fresh water. But prior to running that engine, I put in gra gas treatment inside the fuel tank. So during that 15, 20 minutes or whatever, it allowed the fuel to take and go from the tank through a brand new fuel water separator. I replaced the old one, which is down below here, with a new one and this then would be filled with gas with treatment into here the old one if it had any water in it that would be taken out and now i need to take and check the antifreeze and i take a sample out of here and this one is good for about 40 degrees fahrenheit below zero which is very substantial however there is a caution and the caution is as follows when you go after the engine's been running and you go to take this cap off just like the radiator in your car if you turn this around and the engine's boiling hot you're liable to have scalding antifreeze come out and burn your hands so the, from a safety point of view what you want to do is after the engine is run you let it cool down a little bit and you very carefully, like on your automotive application, you carefully let this, if it has this type of unit, relieve some of the pressure, mm -hmm. and then you can turn the cap and take it off in order to check the antifreeze. Okay. okay. So I did the antifreeze, I did the fuel uh, water separator. Last thing is to drain the oil out and change the oil, and I have taken our vacuum tank and this will suck it's got a vacuum inside the tank I put the hose down through the dipstick hole where you check the oil this would take and suck the oil out of the engine and when I when the oil's out of the engine then I would take off the old oil filter but I would put this down underneath it in the bilge so that if any oil spills it would spill onto this oil wipe and then put a new oil filter on and then refill the oil um, other than that, about the only last thing that I would do is obviously put it back on the air filter here and anywhere where there's points needing lubrication, either with oil or with grease, I would go all over the entire engine, make sure that there's lubricant around, and then I would also check the belts, the fan belt. Uh, or any number of fan belts you might have on a particular engine. But for any reason though, you don't know exactly what you're doing, the best advice I could give would be find someone who's a professional and, and let them do it. It costs you a little bit of money, but it's well worth it. Right. Save yourself a lot of headaches and also a lot of expense, especially if something uh, goes wrong. Super. And that's about it, Paul.